Listen, you guys, my guest today lost 50 pounds. And this was all just by identifying and healing the underlying causes of her emotional eating. My guest is Trisha Nelson, and she has spent over 30 years researching the hidden causes of the addictive personality. Trisha is an emotional eating expert and TEDx speaker, author of the number one best-selling book, Heal Your Hunger, Seven Simple Steps to End Emotional Eating Now. And she's the host of the popular podcast, The Heal Your Hunger Show. And she's just a highly regarded speaker. She's been featured on NBC, CBS, Fox, The List. Oh my gosh, she's just a little rock star. So this is going to be a game changer for you. And you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And that might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there, you know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight, add in Metabolism Fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, ooh, yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form, so you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. So we are talking today about that whole tie-in with emotional eating and self-sabotage and, and sugar addictions. So please, this is going to be such a healing episode for you all because you're going to know that you're not alone in your emotional eating and in your sugar addiction. So listen up and reach out to Trisha if you need her help. She has an amazing offer for you guys today. Hi, everyone. I know you are dying to hear this episode because so many of you are struggling with emotional eating and food addictions and sugar addiction. So today I really want to dive into three secrets to healing sugar addiction with Miss Trisha Nelson, who is a very good friend of mine, special guest, you just hold on to your pants to hear her story. <laughs> hold on to your pants. So Trisha, thank you so much for joining us. I cannot wait to get into this topic. I've been looking forward to it for weeks since we talked about it. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here on your amazing show. And I love your work, Amy. So thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you. Yeah, this is a big topic. I think there are like very few women can't relate. Let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, I hear this all the time from my listeners, from my patients. It's 
and it's a real thing. And we're going to get into this, but, but women will beat themselves up and blame themselves. And I try to tell them, listen, it's physiological. There's some biochemistry involved, like cravings are not just a willpower thing. I mean, there's so much more involved. So Trisha, tell us your story, because I think it's super, super powerful for people to hear you know, how you landed in this space. Yeah, far back as I can remember, food was a huge highlight for me. Like I loved to cook, I loved to eat, I loved to serve food to other people, go out to restaurants. I'd have like heart palpitations when I knew I was headed out to a really good restaurant. So it was like a big deal for me. And, you know, I didn't think a whole lot about it. I just thought I was a foodie. But truth is, my weight, you know, really bothered me. And by age 20, I was 50 pounds overweight. And I hated, I hated having excess weight on my body. I had on this roll on my tummy that I would scrunch up in my hands and imagine cutting off like you cut fat off the side of a steak. Or I thought about getting some disease where I'd automatically lose weight without having to exercise because I hated to exercise. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I had these really crazy thoughts that I never shared with anybody, but it was really indicative of how desperate I felt because I was no stranger to dieting. Like, of course, you know, when you, when you hate your body size, you're like, ah, I'll go on a diet. And so you go down the diet route and I did that for so long with very little results. So I could lose weight, but I'd always put it back on yeah. and then some, you know, and so I was, I was a yo-yo dieter. And at some point I just felt exhausted and like, I cannot do this for the rest of my life. Like, especially because I'm trying so hard and getting nowhere. You know, mm -hmm. it's one thing I was, if I was throwing caution to the wind, I'm like, I'm just going to eat bond up bonds and watch movies all the time. Right. <laughs> like right. I wasn't doing that. I was exercising. I was working hard at, at losing weight, but I always, you know, I, because I had this compulsion to eat where I'd be on a diet for, I could last like a couple of weeks and then this monster would grow inside of me. And I'd just be like, I have to have chocolate or I have to eat that whatever it was I was, I was obsessing about. And then I'd bust out and I'd eat something, but then it would just open this door and then I'd go down the rabbit hole and I'd put the weight back on. So that was a pattern for me over and over. And so I would be like up 30 pounds, down 20, up 40, down 10. And I had like five different sizes of pants in my closet because I never knew what size I'd be. And I was always like hoping to get back down to my, you know, my skinny size. But I mean, I was a normal functioning person in the world, but this was my inner life that other people didn't. I mean, they saw my weight gain, of course, which is very embarrassing, but, but it was this obsession and this constant struggle that I was in that really just broke me. And at some point, Amy, I just felt like I cannot diet again. Like I can't do this for the rest of my life. There has to be a better way. And I think that was my, you know, sort of my prayer and my wish. And, and thankfully, very soon after that, I met somebody who showed me or really taught me about emotional eating and the fact that if I don't heal my relationship with food and my emotional bond to food, you know, the, that's basically why I kept gaining the weight back because I needed food on an emotional level. So he really taught me how to dig deeper under the surface and start clearing out emotions that I've been burying, dealing with my stress in a new way, kind of having a whole new relationship with myself and with life and with people. Like it was a whole kind of like a life makeover to be honest, but it was, it was everything from the inside out. So I literally lost weight from the inside out. Like I started going deeper and it made all the difference in my relationship with food. And that's how I was able to lose weight and keep it off for many, many years now. Wow. That's powerful. That's so powerful. And I can relate in that, in the obsession piece, because when I was competing many, many, many years ago, you do that diet down, deprivation, slingshot back up 20, sometimes 30 pounds. And when you're in that deprived state, that's all you're overly consumed with food. That's all you're thinking about. You're thinking about the next meal and what your cheat meal is going to be. And it's so liberating to not be like that anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like you can yeah. remember it, but you thank God that you're not like that anymore. So I'm sure you feel the same way just looking back at your past behavior. 
I so do. And I'm reminded, you know, from the, my client's stories when they first come to me, cause they're in that terrible cycle. And I think when you're in it, you don't realize how much it's robbing you, yeah. you know, of your sanity, of your freedom, of your peace of mind, of your ability to be present with other people. You know, I was so obsessed with food and when, what I was going to eat, when I was going to eat it, how I was going to get rid of it when I ate it. It's like, it consumed me and I couldn't be present with people that I love. Like I'd be there in body, but yep. not in mind, you know? And that was another secret that I had. I'm like, if people knew that I ha- I don't have an, I, I like a clue as to what they just said to me. Cause I'm thinking about chocolate, you know, right. like it just, it robs you of so much, not to mention if you are carrying excess weight, like your mobility, your sense of fun, your ability to show up as you're meant to be with your beautiful spirit. So it is, I think people get, they sort of numb, they get numb to it and the reality of how much it's taking from them. So when you are able to be free and you look back, you're like, wow, like what a difference. Like I was in bondage. I was absolutely in bondage. Mm -hmm. When we think of addictions, most of us think of the big bad ones, alcohol, drugs, gambling, all of that. But we don't give as much credit to a food addiction because it's food. It's it's allowed. It's what we need it every day. Our bodies need it. Our bodies don't need alcohol. They don't need drugs. We're not going to die without it. But we, we would die without food eventually. So I find it interesting when people really kind of tune into their own compulsions, their own behavior, and really recognize that, yes, this is an addiction. So why do you think people fall into this pattern when they're under a lot of stress, when the going gets rough, especially, my God, the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of people gain weight and and develop or discover their, their food addiction. Why is that? Yeah, well, it's so true. And and I just want to speak to what you just said about, you know, kind of diminishing it. Like we tend to think, oh, this is so silly. Like it's just a cho- like chocolate. It's just, you know, a candy bar. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, carbs. Like why, like how could I possibly be addicted to that? And 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 of course it's no big deal when you compare it to drug addiction or alcohol yeah. addiction. Exactly. But the thing is, to me, it's the hardest of all addictions to overcome because you have to eat, you know, it's like, you have to take your addiction out of the refrigerator three times a day, deal with it, you know, and, and try to have balance around it and then put it back in the fridge. It's like trying to pet a little tiger, you know, and put it back in the cage without getting your ass torn off, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like it is not so easy. So people, people sort of feel embarrassed that they have this problem, but I say it's the hardest to overcome. It's the one that requires the most support mm-hmm. because it, it you have to manage it. You have to manage it without it becoming unmanageable. So that's really, really important to realize is that you're not bad. You're not stupid because you can't control what you put in your mouth. It's really hard and it's real, especially when you deal with sugar because sugar is physically addictive. Yep. Um, you know, for me, stress did play a huge part in my eating because I would use food to kind of modulate my emotions, you know, mm-hmm. and sort of keep myself even because I had a lot of highs and lows. Like I, I could get super excited and I'd eat when I was excited and I could get super depressed and eat when I was depressed to bring my mood up. So we use it kind of to manage our emotions, but also to stuff my emotions. Like I was very, I, I did not like to feel uncomfortable. And so I was us, using food to, to really stuff down uncomfortable emotions and stress is obviously uncomfortable and, and, and we stress eat, like stress eating is a real thing. People do it it's, it's an unconscious habit. Like when we're stressed out, we just reach for food, especially if we are emotional eaters and we're used to reaching for food, it's just a habit period. Um, but we don't often even recognize that we're doing it. Um, and the other thing is when somebody's an emotional eater, and for those who don't know what emotional eating is, it's basically using food for emotional reasons, not for sustenance or nutritional need you know, so it is kind of a nervous habit. So we tend to eat when we're nervous or stressed, or again, we, our emotions are all over the place and we're just trying to settle ourselves down. So that's really what emotional eating is, Mm -hmm. but it's not just the eating, it's the obsessing. It's kind of leaning on our thoughts about food when we're going to get food that in and of itself will sort of take the edge off for us. But the other thing, Amy, is that 
what people don't know is that we actually, as emotional eaters, we tend to have a personality profile, a certain way of being in the world that actually contributes to our stress. And what I mean by that is, you know, in my research, I've I've identified what I call the anatomy of the emotional eater, which is a little play on words, anatomy. But the anatomy of the emotional eater is 24 personality traits that really make up the emotional eater's personality. And the thing about these traits is they have nothing to do with food, but everything to do with why we eat. So to give you an example, you know, overeaters tend to be overdoers. So we tend to get our sense of self from outside of ourselves, you know, because we oftentimes we grew up with trauma. We didn't get a strong, I didn't get a strong sense of myself growing up. I was sort of lacking in self-esteem. And so I wanted the Atta girls. I wanted people to think I was wonderful. It really cared. And so I was out doing people all the time. I was running circles around people, doing those extra projects, doing, doing, you know, whatever I could for people to notice me and affirm me because I didn't have that sense of self, you know, a strong sense of self. But the problem with overdoing and people pleasing, which is the number one trait of an emotional eater, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to get that that validation from outside of ourselves. And the problem with that is we run ourselves ragged. And I'm sure you see this time and time again, among people that you help, you know, we run ourselves ragged doing for others, caretaking, you know, trying to be number one and trying to be superwoman. And then we're exhausted, our adrenals are exhausted, you know, our hormones are out of whack. And then not only that, but we're super resentful because nobody's ever as pleased (laughs) as we plan on them being, right? And we're like, like an offhanded thank you. Do you realize I busted my butt for this project? Or do you know, I pulled an all nighter to get those brownies made for the soccer team. And it's like, people barely notice because they're kind of used to us, you know, when we're doing everything up the slack. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's a deadly combination, you know, overdoing, exhausting our bodies and then being pissed off. You know, And so what that does is it sort of leads itself to overeating and kind of, I call it the, I deserve it binge, like screw them. Like they're not going to recognize me. I'm going to get my favorite meal, sit down in front of the TV and treat myself. So that's kind of, but that's an example of how we actually create our own stress, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, so much of the time we, we sort of feel like victims of our stress, but if we are in that overdoing mode, which, you know, people who have issues with food, we, we don't want to be with ourselves. Like we don't want to feel our feelings. Right. Right. And so overeating, I mean, mean, overdoing is as much of a anesthetic as you will, as, as eating itself. And so that has to change. And so when people try to diet or control their food without changing how they're living, changing their stress level, they're just getting trapped in the same cycle. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we see, I think all of those things that you just talked about are, are reasons why we see diets fail because life is going to happen. We are going to overdo sometimes, maybe all the time if you're an overdoer. And I love that you pointed out personality traits of sugar addicts, food addicts. Have you, what do we want to call people? Do, food it's, addicts? I is put that, it is that so- not cool? It's totally cool. I I have a a quiz on my website, which might be, you know, good for people to take it. It tells you it's sort of a spectrum. Now I find like emotional eating is kind of a good all over all around term because wherever you are on the spectrum, it's emotionally driven. Even if you're an under eater, like some people are super restrictive and they're under eating, but that's emotionally driven too. Like you can be an overeater, under eater, a weird eater, you know, you do weird yeah. rituals around food. Like it doesn't yeah. really matter. It's emotionally driven. So I like the overall umbrella term of emotional eating, okay. but I have a quiz on my website where they can find out if they're an emotional eater or a food addict. And food addiction to me is like emotional eating on steroids. Like when you really take it so far that it makes you feel sick, it impedes your pr- productivity at your job, your health is impaired you know, you're like, your marriage is on the rocks because you're so obsessed with food or you're hating your body. You don't want to have sex. It's like, there's so many different aspects of it, but when it really 
to me, I was a food addict in that I was so obsessed, Amy, and I, and I was a binge eater. And so it got really dark for me. Like when I would be in binge mode, my whole personality was affected. Like I hated myself. So to me, that's kind of like the far end of the spectrum. Yeah. And, and this quiz will tell somebody where they are on that spectrum. But to me, it's to be qualified as emotional eating, but it's just where you are on the spectrum is whether you're a food addict or just kind of general messed up eating. <laughs> no, that, that makes total sense. I want to use the correct like PT terms because, but that does, that makes sense because you move from emotional eating and that can very easily turn into a full-blown addiction. Totally. Yeah, it's, a like, per, it's progressive, just like progressive. alcohol addiction. Exactly. Exactly. So, and it's so crazy to hear your story because to know you, to see you, I can't wrap my mind around you being heavier, around you being obsessed about food, around you beating yourself up because you're such a powerful, confident woman now. And so it's hard for me to, but that's, that's a key point though, in that don't be judging people because you don't know what they're going through. And, so and I think we so easily point the finger at at individuals who are carrying excessive weight, that they're lazy or sloppy or don't want to do the hard work. And they could have a ton of shit going on behind the scenes that you have no idea about. Well, it's so true. And, you know, when somebody has a weight problem, the most obvious thing to do is to diet, but diets will fail us, you know, and the fact the statistic is like 95 to 98% of all diets fail, which is an abysmal statistic because it's like a multi- hundred billion dollar industry, you know? Mm -hmm. And so people just, they default to diets, but diets don't give you tools for living. No. They, all they do is take away your most, you know, your most fundamental tools for how you cope with stress. Like you eat, you know, that's right. when, if you're in that mode you eat. And so a diet will take away all your coping skills, all the ooey gooey, chewy, yummy foods that you yeah. use to deal yeah. Take them away, and it's like go get them, tiger. And 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 after a couple of weeks, you're like, I have to have my food. It's it's. But what we're really craving is a way to cope, you know. And it's our old coping tools. So diets don't give you new coping tools if you don't develop a whole new set of tools for how to deal with life. You'll go back to what you know, what's comfortable. So, you know, what I do with Heal Your Hunger, my company is that we teach people that set of tools, like how to deal with life so you don't go back to your old tools of, you know, coping. And it makes all the difference. And it not only makes a difference, but it helps you be happier all the way around because food is really just a symptom. You know, we're eating, my experience is overweight is a symptom of overeating and overeating is a symptom of what's eating you. So we've got to get down to what that's about. And this is where what you and I do mesh so beautifully because I see mostly women, women who are doing all the things, really, really trying, really trying to hone in and exercise and eat well and they're still gaining or they still can't lose. So then they get into, so for my ladies, it's going to be that, that physiological piece. They have a, a you know, underactive thyroid. They're going und undiagnosed, insulin resistance, hormonal disruption. But then that easily leads into, and I've termed this before, screw it syndrome, where they just, well, nothing's working anyways, because like yeah. you said, no diet works. And I always say that too. You can do, you know, the, this diet, that diet, keto, paleo, your slim baby mama diet, and nothing's going to work unless you deal with the shit inside, whether it's emotional, yes. mental, physical, biological, whatever it is, you have to deal with that because there's no diet in the world that you can follow that's going to last long term. No doubt about it. It's so we have to change at such a, you know, more fundamental, deeper level. But the thing is, when you make changes at that level, it has a ripple effect in all of your life. You know, yeah. if you just go on a diet by hook or by crook, you cut out yeah. the foods, you slim down, you're fitting in a new clothes, but you, you're just like this, the problem hasn't been solved. You know, the reason why you gain the weight in the first place hasn't been solved. It is going to be short lived. You're not going to live you know, in that body for very long before you're going back to the old way. So when you do go deeper, 
you know, not only does it affect your weight, you know, if you're not emotionally eating, you'll lose weight automatically, my experience, because so much of the missing pieces, uh, after you fix the physical, after you've done these other things, oftentimes the overlooked part is we're still overeating because we're using food for emotional reasons. But, you know, my experience is if you, if you go deeper, if you solve the root causes, you know, it, it not only will help you lose weight, but it'll just make you happier all the way around. Like everything will be better. Your relationships yeah. will be better. Your sex life will be better. Your, your, you know, productivity at work, your sense of creativity, your sense of self-esteem, like a diet can't give you that. Definitely. So it's a much better way to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, I've heard you mention self-sabotage before, and I want every single one of my active patients, if you are working with me, you listen to this because you will ultimately, <laughs> seriously, you will ultimately self-sabotage yourself. I know I have done it. So Trisha, I want you to speak a little bit more on self-sabotage when people are kind of moving through, let's say your program of quitting sugar and, and healing their hunger and healing their emotional eating issues. What about the self-sabotage piece? Ooh, it's so tricky and it's so, you know, it is so common and I think it's kind of a human as well, but we definitely, you know, we've spoken to parts of it already and that's that, you know, self-sabotage comes when, first of all, we have a belief system about where we should be mm -hmm. and we're in, when we're in that cycle of losing and gaining and losing and gaining, you know, that's sort of uh, what we know. Like, that's what we know. So we don't even believe it's possible to lose weight and keep it off. We're like, oh, she's going to drop soon. She's yep. going to drop soon. If we keep thinking she's going to drop soon, guess what's going to happen? She's going to drop. Gonna drop. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to change our belief system. But also, you know, when we've done the same thing over and over and it's been superficial, you know, my experience is that monster is going to grow inside of us, that compulsion to eat that comes from the emotional overwhelm, you know? And mm -hmm. so people I work with, you know, they're so used to the diet syndrome. Like when you first go on a diet, you're so excited. You're like, I'm doing it. You're it's like, Monday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Monday. We're going to do this. It's going to be different, you know, and you do the whole diet thing. And you have that new diet syndrome where you're excited and you've got sort of that you know, that energy behind it. Yeah. But again, for me, it was two weeks, like it could last two weeks and then things would get really hard. Like I was no longer excited. I was no longer like, woohoo. I was like, oh God, you know? And it's like, how much longer can I do this? But it's really because you don't have the energy of the new thing, you know, for one thing, the bright, shiny object, you don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. But also you've got this overload of emotions and thoughts you know, and you don't have a plan for that. So my experience is that so often why we sabotage is that all of a sudden it's just hard. It's hard and we don't have those new tools. So that's certainly part of it. But the other thing too is my experience is it's really hard, you know, to deal with this food problem on your own, which is of course what everybody wants to do, like, cause they're embarrassed by it. They think it's so not a big deal compared to alcohol or drugs, or whatever. So who am I to like reach out for support? Like, like that makes me seem so weak. So we have all this judginess mm -hmm. around not being able to do it on our own, but we can't, you know, again, hardest addiction of all to overcome. Uh, we've probably had it longer than we've had other negative habits because my experience, like I started using food at a very young age. Cause it's all I had, you yeah. know, when you're a kid, you can't, you don't have a lot of options for killing your pain. You know, if you have trauma and you have, or you have a messed up family life, like you yeah. need somehow to get by and food's right, the cookie jar is right there. So my experience is we started this addictive habit much longer than somebody, you know, or much sooner than somebody started a drug or alcohol habit. So mm -hmm. it's so built in for us that of course we need support, you know? So we need yeah. to stop judging ourselves for that. We don't, we don't have second, like we don't, we don't second guess ourselves or judge ourselves when we hire a trainer. It's very clear. I'm not going to exercise as much if I don't have somebody kicking my butt. Like it's just right. not going to happen. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Like I go to a class, a bar class because during the pandemic, they did it on Instagram where I could do it at home. Did I? No, 
Like I just, I quit. Like I'm 20 minutes in, I'm like, ah, I'm good. You yeah. know, whereas if I go to the class, I'm there for an hour. I'm not going to leave. I would be embarrassed. So, so getting support is super important also because the sabotaging thoughts, you know, come from within, you know, our head is like, ah, oh, you're not going to do it. Or you're going to just quit or it's never worked before. I mean, our heads never shut up and it's too much. Like you can't resist that on your own. Whereas if you get support and you have, you know, a framework it's for going deeper. I mean, it's kind of, there's not just one way to stop self-sabotage because it's sort of multi-tiered, but you get support from others where you can get reflected positive messages that will, you know, kind of drown out the negative ones in your head, yeah. but also you have a system for going deeper, setting, you know, getting a new set point, a new belief system around what's possible. And also getting off the diet track so you can try a new way. Like these are all ways that can help with the self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. And I find, uh, you can let me know if you see this too, but when a person is starting to succeed, they also self-sabotage because of that little voice in their head that's going, well, you know what, Trisha? I mean, you lost 20 pounds. So you can probably treat yourself. You can yeah. get away with this. You can get away with that. And then you allow that voice to play over and over again. And two weeks later, you're like, what the hell happened? I just put on 10 pounds. And you don't realize that those little bites of that you're allowing yourself to have is total self-sabotage. Well, this is why I do um, like my quit sugar challenge because people are always like, they're, they're always like, can I have some? And yeah. for some foods, the answer is no. Like, like, like I can't eat a little bit of sugar without wanting a lot of sugar. Like it, it's, it's a slippery yeah. slope for me. Mm -hmm. And while some people want to have their cake and eat it too, I find that this is where the addictive part of certain foods has to be recognized, yep. you know, and I found through much trial and error, I found that none is actually better than some. Okay. So when it's an addictive substance when it's addictive food or an ingredient that literally has a, an, a physically addictive quality like sugar does yeah some for me just takes me on a ride you know it takes me on a ride and so I'm actually when I'm at a party you know it's easier for me to say no thank you than let me try one because yeah. let me try one just opens up the doors and then it's hard to get back to your place of feeling good and and strong and grounded you know, because then it seeps into your head, like, well, that was good. You know, let me try some of this or, or it's even worse when you had one and you were okay. So you're like, see, I yes. had one and I'm okay. I'm good. I'm really over this, you know? Yeah. And so I think that again, much hard one trial and error, like, you know, it's actually easier for me not to eat sugar than to try to eat a little bit. Cause I don't want a little bit. Like I don't want a spoonful of ice cream. I want the pint. I want to take the lid off and throw it out and eat the whole pint. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's to me, I'm a sugar addict. So that's how it's been for me. So it's been so much easier for me to kind of know this about myself, know this about my body. Not everybody's this way, but I am, you know? Right. And so when we know this about ourselves, it's actually it's actually, it's, it's not deprivation. So many people are like, oh, I don't want to be deprived. But to me, it's like depriving yourself of what? Like the struggle, the information, yeah. the feeling bad about myself, the trying to stop, you know, like just have one, trying to be normal. Like, well, Susie can have one. Like, why yeah. can't I have one? It's like all this noise starts once I take that bite. And it's like, what am I depriving myself of? Like the, the hell and the struggle? Like, no, when I say no, thank you. And I know who I am. I'm a sugar addict. It's easier for me to say no than it is to say, give me a little bit. When I know this about myself, I can actually feel more peaceful around certain foods. So I think that's really important to realize too. But it does, like you said, it always starts with that little rationalization. Yeah. And, and when we look at the studies too, Trisha, I mean, you know this, I'm just telling the listeners, when they do MRIs of the brain, sugar lights up the same part of the brain as cocaine. So yeah. it's producing that same high, that same in certain people, not in all of us, but in, in those who are predisposed to being a sugar addict, it is going to light up that part of the brain. And just like a cocaine addict is not going to do just one line and then be done for the rest of the year. Right. 
You're no, going for no more way. sugar. You're going for yeah. more sugar. So to say to a sugar addict, well, you can just have a little bit. And listen, I was with this woman last week. She did not eat sugar. She did not eat. They were kick-ass dessert sitting there. I was eating one right next to her. She did not eat sugar. So she is true to her word. Like she knows, her, Trisha knows herself. And yeah. what she is saying to you is absolutely true. I mean, you know what's going to happen to you if you do just have one. Yeah, it's just yeah. not, it's not fun for me. It's just not fun. It's, it's, I, and I like feeling good, you know, and my body just thanks me yep. when I put the right foods in it. That's for sure. So what is that, the, the biggest emotion that you have found working with people? What is that one emotion that really drives emotional eating or can we not really narrow it down to just one? Yeah. In fact, I so I love that you asked that there's um, I'm going to give you what I call the pep test. And this is a way, I mean, there is not just one emotion for me. It's just not wanting to feel, you know, like I don't want to feel uncomfortable, but, but the pep test can be a good way for somebody who's like, what is this emotional eating talk? Um, you know, you can start to understand it. And, and the nice thing about the fact that we are having this conversation is it's hard to unhear this stuff. When I first heard the term emotional eating, I thought, well, that's stupid. I just like food. Like, that's it. Yeah. You know, case closed. But then I started to observe the way I am with food. I'm like, hmm, you know, I'd go out to lunch with my friends and they'd order a sandwich and it would come with fries and they'd eat their sandwich and pick up their fries. I'm like, why would anybody do that? Like, I'll eat my fries and pick up my sandwich. You know, so I like I liked the heavier, carby, sugary foods mm -hmm. because they anesthetized my emotions. So the pep test are the three primary emotions that do drive our eating. So the first P is uh, stands for painkiller. So we use food, namely the heavier foods, because they do like put a blanket on uncomfortable feelings. And people aren't aware of this or like they're they're not like you know, hand me the bread, I'm going to kill some feelings. Like we don't say that it's unconscious, right? but we definitely gravitate towards heavier, denser calorie rich foods because they, they make us feel better, which is another way of saying they kill the pain. Mm -hmm. Like when light in life is hard, there is pain all around mm -hmm. either our pain or somebody else's pain. It life isn't easy. Right. And so right. we want to sort of soften the edges of life and have your like salads don't cut it like they don't they don't soften the edge like carbs do okay right. carbs and sugar so the first p is painkiller the second uh letter is e which stands for escape mm -hmm. you know in my experience we're not only overdoers but we're also overthinkers so we tend to overthink everything. Like, what did she mean by that? Why did he look at me that way? Did I do it good enough? Oh, I didn't do it. I suck. You know, it's like our heads never turn off. Right. And so we want to get away from our minds, you know, and, and I used to get my favorite binge food sitting from my favorite bingeable TV show, you know, and I would just check out because I was so tired of how, like, I would worry and fret and think and trying to manage everybody else's life it's like it was exhausting being me you know so yeah. so escaping my head is a big part of why I ate you know and the last p and pep stands for punishment which seems counterintuitive because we think of food as a reward like we're going to get our favorite foods and reward ourselves and it is at the outset but for those people who are kind of higher on the emotional eating spectrum and more in the food addiction range you know, for those who are bingers and go overboard and end up feeling sick and pissed at themselves and their body's paying for it, gut issues, you know, gas, bloating, inflammation, you know, flaring up of whatever autoimmune issues people have. It's like, that is not a treat. Okay. That is right. not a reward. That is punishment that we do to ourselves. And it begs the question, why would we do that to ourselves? Why would we make ourselves feel sick? Right. And my experience is, you know, we're also over feelers. So we feel guilty about everything. It's just, we're super prone to guilt. Mm -hmm. And so then we beat ourselves up with poor treatment around food. And so this thing, this pep test is a way, you know, it stands for painkiller escape and punishment. Yeah. These are, this is a way for people to start kind of taking a look at their eating. Like I used to go to the refrigerator, Amy, like 
five times an evening, like checking. I'd be like checking, like, is there anything new in there that I could eat? Like I was, I was hungry. I was like, what can I eat? It was not food I was really hungry for, of course. But, you know, people who have this tendency to be always, mm, we're always looking for something. Yeah. It's generally not physical. It's emotional hunger. But you can take the PEP test and think, is there something that I'm uncomfortable about? Is there something happening in my life that's really kicking my ass and I want to just sort of get relief from? And then you can start seeing there is a connection between our cravings and our eating. And that's where we can start having more of a conversation about the emotional underpinnings of our eating. I love it. Yeah. Dev, I love that. I love the pep test. That's yeah, that's perfect. And I think that that ties back to, like you said, the, the core reason why. And I think each one of it, even if you don't check all three boxes, you can check a box for sure. I know I can yeah. hearing you explain that. So what can people do if they're really resonating right now going, oh man, just like you, Trisha, just like you were like, oh, I'm not an emotional, well, maybe I am an emotional eater. So what can people yeah. do to kind of start, take that first step on their healing journey and really kind of address it head on, really face it? Yeah, well, if if somebody's kind of like, I'm so tired of this, I do, um, if it's okay to talk about my quit sugar challenge, because yes. that's a great way, that's a great way to start for somebody. So the quit sugar challenge is a five day journey. And it's not just about quitting sugar. And you don't have to quit sugar in five days, like, but you can just get started on it and get support because it's going to be hard, you know, on your own. So we have a community of people of women who are quitting sugar together. And what I do is I teach throughout the week, just kind of the mechanics of it, because what I didn't realize at first on my journey is that there are so many hidden sugars and food and names of sugars that don't make it sound like it's sugar. And so I'd be trying to eat really healthy, but I'd be sabotaging myself by eating hidden sugars. And then I'd crave and go like be crawling the walls and then I'd, I'd go eat. So I teach people how to really spot hidden sugars in their food, read labels, get the sugar out. We clean out our cupboards. We kind of have a contest around that. And, and that therefore it's easier again, for me, none is better than some. So it's easier if I'm not like still eating sugar, you know, uh, unknowingly, it's easier to quit sugar. So we do that, but, but I also support people by teaching about emotional eating and people start digging into what that's about during those five days, Mm -hmm. because nobody's going to stay quit. Like you can quit for five days, but it's not going to last unless you take that next step and go deeper. And so I also help people understand self-sabotage, understand emotional eating during those five days. And it's really cool because we do, um, we do a morning mindset call Mm -hmm. uh, first thing in the morning. And then we have the class midday. And then for those who sign up for the VIP, which is just extra time, like we have a whole nother class afterwards where we hang out and I answer questions for people. So it's really nice. It's super affordable. It's crazy, crazy, crazy cheap to do this, but it will be, it's like a great first step for people for really starting to understand this from a whole new perspective and get that community support. That's so important. Oh, community support is key. It's key, especially when you're doing something, the, the work that you're going to be doing with them. I think it's it's vital to have that. Somebody that just has your back. So we're going to yeah. have that link in the show notes for everyone so they can sign up. And basically, as you are listening to this, you'll probably have about a few days to a week to jump in and join. So there won't be a wait, a long waiting period. This starts July 25th. 2022. So as you're listening to this, if you're in that sweet spot, definitely click the link below and sign up for the five day quit sugar challenge. I think that's going to be great. I hope my patients do it too. My listeners, my patients, you know, you, you can't get enough support. You just can't. Well, you're going to help your health so much. If you're not eating sugar, it's going to, I mean, there are, there's like no redeeming besides taste, which of course sugars can be yummy, but Besides taste, there's no redeeming qualities to sugar. So any, any solid plan of eating, any solid of solid protocol for healing your body is going to include getting sugar out of your diet. You know, Mm -hmm. it's just going to speed up your healing process. So you're going to do yourself a big favor, but the cool thing is, you know, 
Amy, is that I offer all these different recipes and, and these swaps so people can still enjoy their food. Yes. Okay. So I'm not into misery. Okay? Yes. I'm not into like, I still love my food. I, I eat great, you know? And so, but I know how to avoid the sugar, but still enjoy sweet food. So we yep. have really good swaps and use things like stevia and monk fruit and all these recipes where you can still make great tasting food but without the, you know, the detriment of sugar. And also if it's, if somebody's listening to this past the time, if they still go to that link that Amy provides, you can get on the waiting list for the next quit sugar challenge that we do. Amazing. Amazing. I'm so happy you said that. I always talk about replacement foods. Like you don't have to go miserable. You can no. still have that. And I realize you'll always have the extremists where they're like, oh no, even if I put monk fruit on my tongue, there goes the addiction and I'm going off the rails. But for most of us, we can use the subs we, and not artificial yeah. sweeteners for God's sake, but we can use the good substitutes that when yeah. you eat them, you go, you know what? That's, that's not bad. And actually when you truly do quit sugar, and I know you can speak to this too, Trisha, when you, if you were to, to have a bite of, if you were to go, you know, it's Halloween and you open that Reese peanut butter cup, I'm going to tell you, it's going to taste horrible. It's going to taste too <laughs> sweet. It's going to taste fake. It's going to taste plastic. And you're going to be like, this used to be my favorite thing in the entire world. And it's not going to taste good anymore. That's true. Isn't that yeah. great? <laughs> wonderful. It's a wonderful yeah. thing. You'd be like, give me that dark chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that hundred percent dark cacao. Yeah. 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 Well, Trisha, thank you so much. I mean, they can also get your book, uh, heal your hunger. You have a whole movement, a whole program, heal your hunger, a whole business. Yep. So, podcast, yeah. Whole thing. yeah. Podcast, everything. I mean, you have, you have built a following, you have built a much needed community around emotional eating and healing your hunger mm. and quitting sugar. And I love it. I absolutely love it. You're Thanks. doing amazing things in the world and a crazy ass Ted talk. Her Ted talk got like a bajillion views. So you got to go watch that <laughs> too. Cause that's kick ass. So Trisha, tell people how they can find you social. We're going to put all of this in the show notes, the, the, the five day quit sugar challenge link in the show notes, but how can people find you in general? Yeah, and my po my podcast is called the Heal Your Hunger Show. Um, they can take the quiz on the website, which is healyourhunger.com. Heal is H E A L, and then I'm Trisha Nelson underscore at the end of Nelson on Instagram. Beautiful. Let me put all that in the notes so people can find you. So, Trisha, thank you so much for your time today. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. I'm so looking forward to the challenge. I know so many people are going to benefit from that. Thank you for having me and thanks for your amazing work. I mean, you're such a, such a force in this world for helping women heal. So I just, I love that about you. So thanks for having me. It's been fun. All right back at you, lady. So we will talk to you soon.